Well, hello there. It seems like people really enjoy it when I talk about things covered in deep layers of copium. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't think we're riding on copium that much. So far, I have not made up a single thing, I am simply presenting things that already exist. And as my videos got traction, I started getting some valuable feedback. So before we begin today's video, let's have a look at some of the things you just had to point out. For those of you who believe we are starting unhealthy hype, it's fine. As long as we all understand that we are dealing with hypotheticals. Vedete, i dev stanno vedendo i suoi video. And that we will all be bold by the time it comes out. I also got to interview the person who wrote the upcoming massive League of Legends novel, who was confirmed to now be working on the MMO. Il tipo che ha scritto il libro, bellissimo, compratelo, madonna cara, è bellissimo sto cazzo di libro. Il tipo che l'ha scritto si occuperà anche lui del, dello sviluppo del gioco. Molto probabilmente sarà al reparto quest, eh, barra narrativa, di tutto, del, narrativa del gioco in generale. And he told me that, yes, my videos are being passed among the developers. So you can stop tagging them on Twitter now. Also, that novel is insanely good. It's Game of Thrones in League of Legends. I am excited you for the potential <laughs> lore of the MMO. Next, um, yeah, I am wearing my slippers out of my own volition. Yes, uh, shamans can shapeshift in this universe, just like druids. And yes, Riot confirmed that Legends of Runeterra... Which... Abbiamo già una piccola cosa. La probabile classe degli sciamani, come i druidi su Warcraft, potranno assumere forme animali. Ma quello vabbè era ovvio. E un'altra cosa confermata, Legend of Runeterra è un'enorme ispirazione sia di asset sia di... di lore in generale per il gioco. Which is the card game based on League of Legends, is a big inspiration when it comes to the world building. In case you're wondering what this is about, all the art I am showing you comes from Legends of Runeterra. A game that secretly acts as a massive archive of art that reveals this universe. Esatto. Anyway, after covering the world and all the races and classes the lore supports, we can now dive into the potential endgame bosses of this MMO. Ah, now sì. I know what you're thinking. This game isn't even in the playtesting phase, how can we talk about the raids? Well, you see, that's because Riot was probably thinking ahead of time and they started a bit of a meme in the lore community. They gave this universe way too many world-ending threats. Oh, the sì, downside of this is that, yeah, there was a time when we didn't know... Sì, ci sono... ha, ha detto che ci sono, uh, ci sono troppi, troppi endgame boss, è vero. I Darkin, uh, Lissandra, Void, Mordekaiser, anche Zed probabilmente. E via discorrendo. Which world ending threat was the real world ending threat? Beh, il void. It was a battle between who's the biggest evil. But the benefits are obvious. You have a lot of meaningful enemies that you can remove before you start limiting your storytelling. And in fact, many of these big storylines are written with all the back doors open. Mamma mia. So that in the future they can utilize them for an event in League of Legends or it is stories that were left open purposefully for the MMO. And that's what this video is going to be about. Originally, I wanted to show you 10 storylines that were left open and which would lead into raids. But if you look at the length of this video, yeah, I cut it down to only 7. So without further ado, oh, guarda Sion. It. Since enorme. we are essentially talking about the world of League of Legends, especially if you have seen our last two MMO videos, it goes without saying that this world has material for hundreds of instances. This means that it's really up to Riot to cherry pick which ones they want to do. Madonna, che bello. And since in this video I am only going to mention seven of these, it is highly likely I am not che going bello. to mention the one che esca, cazzo. you would like to see. But if you feel strong about your own idea about the dungeon, feel free to comment about it below. This is all valuable feedback for the developers. I design sono stupendi. Anyway, the seven raids I picked are based on one simple fact. Their stories and setting are perfectly fit for a raid environment. Be it because their stories are set up for a grand finale, or because some of these villains already have a cast of supporting bosses. No, Kalista non è un villain. Simply because the battles would be really cool. And because showing is better than telling, Let's start with the first raid. Diego. One with such a good setup, the raid essentially writes itself. 
The Ascension of Mount ah, no, Targon. Targon. As you may remember, Mount <ride> Bella Chuck, ecco. 52 minuti questo, questo è pesante, questo mi questo mi Ecco i baffi. Stargon was created by the celestial god to serve as a gateway to the celestial realms. And people decide to climb this place for a variety of reasons. Even though only about 1 in 10,000 makes it to the peak, some people try to climb the mountain because they want to be deemed worthy and become a celestial demigod, while for example, the Masian Cosa Tarik? send their criminals here to die trying to climb the mountain. Che pezzo This di merda! Is called the Crown of Stone. And yes, of course, you can't really force Okay, the Masian is a popo delle merda. The criminals to climb the mountain unless you go there with them. So most criminals just flee and start a new life elsewhere. Lol. Also, at the peak of the mountain, we can find Aurelian Soul, the Star Forger. The reason why he is here is because of the crown he is wearing. Long story short, thousands of years ago, when people noticed that Aurelian was crossing the stars, they started worshipping him, which boosted Aurelian's ego. And they crafted him a crown of celestial star metal. Aurelian, already being quite egoistic, donned the crown. Only to realize it was a mind controlling device. <laughs> che cretino! <laughs> In reality, it was the celestial aspects who wanted to hold Aurelian's power the entire time. Now, to be fair, the aspects are using Aurelian's powers for good cause. They are using his celestial fire to purge the void from Runeterra. But still, it is the celestial aspects who enslaved Aurelian. Anyway, Riot can make up a billion... Quindi non penso che sarà molto contento lui. Ecco perché ce l'ha così tanto con gli aspetti di Targo. Che scemo però. ...reasons why we should raid this place. Though I doubt we would be able to fight Aurelian soul at the very peak. You know, he is made out of... ...space. But maybe we need to reach the peak to borrow some of his powers. Or maybe we need to kill a rampant aspect. Or Ma è Zoe questa? Ma questa qua è Zoe? E perché c'ha la, la faccia indemoniata? <ride> la capretta. Ah, non lo so. Maybe we need to kill a rampant aspect. Or maybe we just need to reach the celestial realm for another reason. Simply said, it is easy to make up a reason for this raid to exist. What's more interesting is the setting of this raid. At different levels, the mountain presents you with different enemies. So let's start with what would happen once you enter the raid. You start at the bottom of the mountain, where you are very likely to meet Chip. But Chip is an already established character who shows newcomers the wonders of the mountain. So you follow him around until we arrive at our first boss, Chip. the living mountain itself. This place has plenty of earth elementals who came alive due to the mountain's magic. Now, as I say this, don't confuse the earth elementals with Malphite. Malphite comes from Ishtal, which is quite far away from Targon. Also, he's a good guy, we don't want to fight him. But from the earth elementals who would likely protect this place, We have, for example, the Blue Sentinel, who also appears in League of Legends. But the biggest of them all is the Stonebreaker. This one would be an excellent introductory boss. You know, you're fighting the mountain itself. Cioè, dobbiamo combattere la montagna. Yes, I know he's a bit too big, but you can shrink him for gameplay purposes. WoW has been notoriously known for inconsistent boss sizes and it's fine. Anyway, after Stonebreaker, we go further up the mountain. And suddenly we start meeting all the lesser dragons and their worshippers. The coolest of these are the white flame dragons. There is also an important dragon who Madonna, serves as a beacon sono. to the other dragons called Invialus Vox. But the one that could likely become a boss would be the Eclipse Dragon. That's because Madonna, this dragon figo. is quite precious to the natives on the mountain. Which would be boss number three. You see, further up the mountain we start encountering the tribes. No, tu, bisog who... bisogna fightare tutti gli, aspetti, tutti gli aspetti di Targon. Quindi Diana, Pantheon, Leona, Zoe, Tarik. Questo, no, questa è tutta roba che sta speculando lui. 
fast and they are relatively friendly, just like the Rakur. But the Solari are fanatics who blindly protect the Celestial Realms at any cost. Even in the cinematic you can see how they are protecting the gateway that is leading to the peak of the mountain. And even though it would be cool if Riot allowed us to fight Leona herself, champions in League of Legends tend to wear pretty thick plot armor. <laughs> so instead it would be cool if we could fight one of Leona's champions, the one known as Daylight Spear, Ravoon. Anyway, after defeating the Solari protecting the gateway, we would get near the peak. The first one to meet us here would be the Infinite Mind Split. Ma quanto sono belli! Ma quanto cazzo sono belli tutte queste creature! Raga, ma, ma sono belle, sono varie, non sono mai, non sono mai ric riciclati. Cioè, sono tutti originali. Io boh, rimango stupito. This is a legendary draconic creature with a very unique ability. It is told that its gaze gives you so much knowledge and insight that your mind crumbles beneath it. Lol. So fighting this boss would be all about getting buffs from it, while being careful not to get too many buffs because it would kill you. And then after getting past the infinite mind splitter, we would arrive at the last stand of the mountain, the Arbiter of the Peak. The last guardian standing in the center of the peak, separating Ciao, mortals bubu. from the celestial realms. This is the creature that leads the mortals who survive the climb directly to the celestials. In fact, that's what you can see here. He is guiding Tiari the Traveler to the celestial realms, where they would become the Traveler. But also, in case of emergency, the Arbiter serves as a guardian against unwanted visitors. Two things could happen here. No, sono i, pro i possibili boss e raid del, del MMO, secondo lui. Here, either we fight the Arbiter to get its approval to pass into the Celestial Heavens. In this case, perhaps the Arbiter can test us with the lesser Arbo Celestial Stellare. Beams, or we simply have to destroy the Arbiter. In this case, the Arbiter would probably fight us with the Golems. And finally, Audio. perhaps after beating the Arbiter, we are granted access to the Celestial Realms. And while, again, I doubt we would be able to fight Aurelian Soul, perhaps we could endangering the world. We have two of them that stand out. The first creation is simply known as the Great Beyond. Aurelian Soul himself calls it his magnum opus. This is essentially a smaller celestial dragon Un mini Aurelian Sol. Aurelian's image. So this would be like fighting Aurelian himself, except this would make sense. The one I believe might be a bit more appreciated, however, would be the one known as the Scourge. Il Baron! This is also a celestial being created by Aurelian himself, but League of Legends players might recognize this one as the pure celestial version of Baron Nasher. It is believed that the physical Baron was born out of the pure image. So the Scourge being the final boss would be a really cool nod towards the League of Legends community. See what I mean? I just made up a 7 boss raid. Baron è creatura... No, allora, il, il Baron è una creatura corrotta del Void, probabilmente proveniente da qua. Cioè, credo che sia la sua forma originale questa. Credo, non lo so onestamente. In a heartbeat. And I skipped a lot of details just so this video wouldn't be too long. Bard. There are the celestial beasts, the demons trying to consume the heavens, the dragon roost near the peak where dragons are born, the star hounds, Esmus, the breath of the world, and so on. No. Designing this raid was simple because the lore and the setup is already there. Once again, I did not make anything up. All of this already <laughs> exists in the universe. Un Carlino and Stellare. Lutera has a lot more places just like this one. So, let's have a look at raid number two. The one raid I know as a fact people would love to see is a Darkin raid. I hope you can pull this off in a lot of different ways, but since the roots of the Darkin lore are in Shrima, the raid would most likely be in the deserts. Super quickly, in case you forgot, the Shreeman Empire rose to power after it started using the Sun Disk to reflect celestial magic into their soldiers and turning them into the god warriors known as the Ascended. 
The Ascended were Oh, sto Celestial Magic sta ovunque. Guaranteed immortality. However, their minds were as fragile as they were before. After these Ascended fought the maddening Void Beasts released by their neighbors. Ovvero Cthun. <laughs> they started going a little bit mad. But their minds finally snapped when their Emperor died too and there was no one to give them directions. The story goes that a Darkin known as Zolani, who used to be a great healer, invented blood magic and used it to heal the other Darkin, by which she also infused them with the blood magic, with a secret plan to use the blood magic later to control them all. This was Zolani's secret plan to stop the rampaging Darkin. Unfortunately, the Celestials noticed that the Darkin were very dangerous and they started sealing them inside special weapons. The sad part is, Zolani herself was also sealed inside her blades. So since Zolani was sealed away, there was nobody to control the others. And as a nice bonus, the remaining Darkin were now empowered with blood magic. Fortunately, in the end, the Celestial sealed all the remaining Darkin inside their weapons too. But stupidly enough, the Celestials let mortals to safeguard these Darkin weapons. So of course, some people were tempted to pick up the weapons and use them for their wars. At which point the Darkin immediately dominated the minds and bodies of those who picked them up. So yes, these rampaging god warriors managed to free themselves. So now, let's quickly go through those who would serve as big raid bosses. Beatrix, per forza. Perhaps the most famous one, and as far as we know, the most powerful one, is Aatrox. After Aatrox was sealed away, his blade was picked up by a random warrior in the north. Of course, Aatrox immediately dominated the warrior's body, and since then he's been using blood magic to drain the dead around him. And make himself bigger. That's what you can see in his old cinematic. He starts small but gets bigger the more things he kills. In fact, it got to such a point where Aatrox became the only being to ever kill a celestial god. As I mentioned in the last video, Aatrox stabbed someone wielding the power of the aspect of war so hard, the aspect of war was wiped from the stars. So out of all the Darkin, Aatrox is the ultimate end boss. Besides Aatrox, as mentioned, the second most important Darkin is Zolani. Now, Zolani has canonically not returned yet, but Legends of Runeterra is teasing that she might come back in the future. Also, as a fun fact, in the most recent cinematic, you can see that Talia and Kaisa arrive in front of the faceless statue of Zolani. Next, there is also Varus, a Darkin who was sealed inside a bow inside a well and he got freed after two hunters fell into the well. So now Varus' body is actually occupied by three souls, the two hunters and the Darkin. One could say he's the embodiment of two and a half men. And there is also Cain, the one holding the scythe of a Darkin known as Ras. Che però ancora non si è lasciato corrompere del tutto, cioè a, me a mezzo corpo è, <laughs> è tutto il braccio corrotto, però ancora non è, non è, del, non è del tutto, no, cioè... Rastro non ha ancora del tutto preso controllo di lui. But as far as we know, Cain is pretty good at resisting Rast's power. So I doubt Rast would be freed. Also, Cain is a League of Legends champion. So in order for Rast to come out, Cain would need to die. Eh, non credo. Oddio, in realtà c'è la doppia scelta. O è Shadow Assassin o è Rast. Quindi non lo so come la, come la svilupperanno. Perché non penso... Non penso che possano fare o l'uno o l'altro. And I don't think that's possible with all the plot armor. Infatti. But we are still not done yet. Next, from the lesser known Darkin, there is also Horazi, who was sealed inside a small emblem. Naganeka of Zurita, who was sealed inside a giant ballista. As you can see, she looks a little bit like a chicken. And that's because it is believed that a chicken touched the ballista and the Darkin <laughs> took over the chicken's body. <laughs> and lastly, there is Tarosh, who was sealed inside a massive halberd. The reason why this Darkin raid would work is because all the Darkin have a common goal. They all hate Zolani. They see her as a betrayer who was trying to control them. So in this raid, we would likely fight the other Darkin as we are trying to get to Zolani. 
and after we kill her, we would face Aatrox as the final boss. Since all the Darkin Wars began with Aatrox and Zolani starting a civil war. Also, it turns out that Aatrox was the general of all the other Darkin. So killing Aatrox would be the perfect end to the Darkin chapter. But let's not forget that Wright is already teasing a new Darkin. The next champion in League of Legends might be a dog that picked up a Darkin dagger. And if you're wondering why we would raid this place, first of all the Darkin are pretty one-sided bad guys. But we could be led here by Nasus and Sivir. Nasus is an Ascended who avoided corruption, so he would be likely happy to put down his former brothers and sisters. And Sivir is holding the very first blade to be ever used to seal a Darkin. So once again, the lore is already there. And aesthetically, Nessuno we have a good idea of fuggire what dalla propria ombra. Grazie, Zero. Questa sub è per te e la tua cucciola. Un abbraccio. Look, c'è un sub per noi! Grazie mille dei 10 mesi. Look like two. We would start outside around the temples of Zolani, which look creepy and corrupted. And later we delve beneath them to where the land is tainted by blood and death. For the next raid, let's stay in Shurima. Because if there is a raid I would personally love to see, it is the raid on Nerimazeth, a city that is in ruins. That's because Nerimazeth was the place where Shurimans tried to build the very first sun disk. This first version failed and instead of the Ascended it was only producing the Bakai, which are broken, twisted versions of the glorious Ascended. <laughs> and in the end the entire city collapsed onto itself. After that the Shurimans tried to build the sun disk again, but this time in the middle of the desert. But now, why would we want to raid these ruins? Well, that's because this city is being rebuilt by Zerath, oh, the most Zerato. arcane mage on Runeterra, whose body was turned into pure arcane Sic energy, sicuramente che Zerath sarà un boss, energy by the sun disk itself. Long story! Colui che ha tradito Azir e ha praticamente buttato giù un regno da solo, un regno millenario anzi. Shorter. When Emperor Azir was a child, he became friends with a nameless slave. And despite slaves being forbidden from having names, he called him Zerath. Throughout the years, the two became as close as brothers, studying culture and history whenever possible. Later on, despite his father hating him, Azir became his only surviving son. So unless his mother gave birth to another child, he would become the emperor anyway. Well, in secret, Zerath simply made sure she would not give birth to another child. Usually he did it by corrupting the infant in her womb. Because it turns out this entire time Zerath was trying to break his roots from slavery. And now he had the ambition to gain power himself. So he justified these murders by telling himself that he was protecting a friend. Despite his efforts, the queen did give birth to another child. So Zerath summoned a storm and let a lightning kill the queen and the child. Eventually all these events led to Azir becoming the crowned emperor of Shurima with Zerath by his side. From this point on, Zerath was waiting for Azir to finally get rid of slavery. Which never happened. Despite Azir being the most beloved emperor in history, he allowed slavery to keep going on. Ah. And that hai capito, l'amato am imperatore, che però ha continuato la schiavitù. Molto amato. E tra l'altro, è molto riassunto, perché Azir aveva promesso a Xerath di, di, annullare, la, di, cioè di, di annullare la schiavitù nel, nel, nel regno e anche la sua. E solo che non l'ha fatto, quindi lui sentendosi tradito gli ha fatto Ah sai che c'è? E ma te lo metto in culo. Angered Xerath. At the end of the story, the Emperor was chosen to become an Ascended himself. But during the ceremony, when the Sun Disk was focusing its power into Azir's body, Zerath was so full of his BS, he incinerated him and forced all the power of the Sun Disk into himself. This resulted in Zerath's body being turned into pure arcane energy, the death of Azir, and the collapse of the Sun Disk and the destruction of the entire Empire. You wanna know the twist at the end? If you read the story from Azir's perspective, 
you learn that he did want to remove slavery. He just wanted it to be a surprise. In <laughs> fact, he even announced it just as Zerath betrayed him. But Zerath already murdered way too many people, so even though he really wanted to stop, it was too late to go back. So Zerath doomed the entire empire. And yes, because the Cioè, praticamente tutto questo si poteva evitare semplicemente dicendo, non so, 5 minuti prima, ah, abbia, ho tolto la, la, la schiavitù. <laughs> Invece no, l'ha detto 5 minuti dopo, rip. The emperor died. Zerath is also technically the reason why the Darkin exist. I already mumbled about the lore for way too long, so just know this. Nasus's brother, Renekton, bound Zerath in a sarcophagus and he locked himself with Zerath in a tomb. Ed è diventato pazzo per questo. Many years later, scavengers opened the tomb and released Renekton and Zerath. As I said, Zerath is currently in Nerimazeth, and he is actually trying to rebuild the original Sundisk. We don't really know why he is doing it, but I think it's safe to assume that he just wants more power. But you know what it smells like to me? It smells like a big old setup for a future raid. Che Kazuki ha la tua stessa vita? La mia stessa vita. Cosa vuol dire la mia stessa vita? Ciao Rinsmer. Sì, Lux, sì, andiamo, andiamo. Alex. Dai. Dai. In Legends of Runeterra you can see Zerath with all his worshippers. You can also see all the minibosses around him. Especially we know about Demi Yin, the Unbound. Sti cose che mi ricordano tantissimo gli elementali di, di WoW. Ah, gli elementali sono, sono abbastanza simili tra loro. But besides all of these heralds and acolytes, this raid would also have the Bakai, the original experimental ascended who come from this city. But also we would fight Renekton himself. Because it turns out after hundreds of years of being locked in a tomb with Zerath, Zerath broke his mind by whispering to him that Nasus betrayed him. He purposefully led him to rot in the darkness. That's why Renekton is quite crazy these days. <laughs> it all goes back to Zerath, who might be the ultimate villain of Shrima. For the next raid, why don't we play off of the success of Arcane? No spoilers, don't worry. Previously, when I told you about the city spilled over and zone, I showed you that at the very bottom of that place you can find the ruins of an ancient Shuriman city. But that will become just a dungeon. The one that would become an interesting raid would be the Empire of Renada Glask. After I mention this, I know a lot of you will be confused. After all, Renata Glask is just a rich baron from Zaun, how can she support an entire raid? Well, in this case, it is all built on two factors. First of all, Renata is way too big of a character to be removed in just a dungeon. But more importantly, Renata Glask released this year, and she was released as yet another big villain after all the other already established villains in Piltover and Zone, She simply really feels like a setup for something in the future. Because after already having Singed and Urgot and Victor as villains in Zone, Riot didn't need uh, to Victor, make up another. It feels obvious they released Renata to be a villain supervising the other bad guys of Zone. Before her, Zone didn't really have a main villain. So obviously she is now filling that role. Her lore is making her the main boss of Zorn. Her raid would be very clear in its structure. We would follow the detective case of Caitlyn and Vi as we try to okay, find her hideout. Uh, Perhaps Camille and Il raid di zone Piltover farà sborrare un sacco di gente perché giustamente Arcane ha avuto luogo lì. Extremely dangerous assassin from Piltover would be also interested in killing her. From that point on, we would literally raid her place with the Wardens. 
As a nice bonus, people would love to see the popular champions Zeri and Echo on our side, both of which are kids from the streets who have destroyed her warehouses before. But the last puzzle piece is why would we raid Renata? Well, the Glask family owns Glask Industries, which is the most luxurious brand in Piltover and Zone. They sell perfumes and really fancy limbra placements. And unfortunately, this brand reflects a bit of real life. Since these fancy formulas are developed down in Zon, using slave labor. But there is also a darker twist. All their products are infused with a chemical formula, which can turn their customers into mindless rampaging husks at any moment. Ah. It's kinda like Apple. Now, since <laughs> Renata is a recent champion, that's all her story really has. She is probably the most powerful Baron in Zone, who can make an entire city fall into chaos. Ah, with quindi c'ha tipo un mind control device, in poche parole. With the press of a button. And now we're just waiting to see when she would unleash it. If you ask me, I normally wouldn't think that this would be a great raid. But this would be very different from raiding dragons, which would actually give it the benefit of changing environment. But also remember, this is riding off of Arcane's fame, and I doubt Riot would pass on that opportunity. Sì, That's no. why I feel confident we will meet Renata in the MMO. And now we are diving into the top three raids. I am extremely confident that some form of these yeah. will be in the MMO. That's for two reasons. First of all, these big villains are way too big to be ignored. We are talking about characters in the style of Arthas Menethil. But also, their lore turns them into world-threatening enemies that have to be dealt with. With the first of these being Viego, eh, the ruined king. There is not a sliver of a doubt we will see the ruined king in the MMO. È ovvio, assolutamente. A parte che gli hanno dedicato tipo boh, quanti mesi alla ruination, compreso il libro di adesso. Impossibile che non lo facciano. È ovvio che sarà un raid, anche perché minaccia l'intero mondo, quindi... You can point a gun to my head, tell me to guess a villain in this MMO, and I will smile knowing that I survived. It would be unimaginable to ignore him. Now, the issue lying in front of me right now is that Viego's story is massive. On top of the normal story he has in League of Legends, he got his own book that is 400 pages long, the entire RPG game called Ruined King, which is focusing on his reawakening, and League of Legends got its own in-game event that was focusing on pushing his lore forward, which also included three cinematics. Right now, Viego has the most lore out of any champion. No, il libro è su vari personaggi. Viene la c'è la point of view di Kalista, quella di Trash e quella di Rides. Champion in this universe. So let me summarize it as quickly as possible. Viego was a Camavoran prince who was forced into becoming the... Non è proprio la protagonista, anche... Cioè, anche tre... Anzi, Trash è il primo capitolo addirittura. Ed è il perno che muove tutto quanto. King at an early age. Because of this, he was not ready to become a king and many would not consider him a really good king. Still being a teenager, he often threw tantrums in the style of Kylo Ren. To keep the kingdom from crumbling, he relied on his two advisors, Kalista and Nuno Necrit of Camavor. <laughs> yes, that's the character named after me. Eventually, Viego met the love. Tra l'altro, che tra l'altro, sto Nuno Necrit è pure uno stronzo. Perché ha tradito Kalista. Life is old. A woman whom he loved very, 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 very eh, deeply. Aggiungi i veri, sono, tro sono troppo pochi. È praticamente impazzito dopo che è morto. He loved her so much that he would do anything for her. But she didn't abuse it. Isolt was actually a very good queen. For the majority of Viego's ruling, he waved the kingdom's problems away just so he could be with Isolt. Until the day someone tried to poison Viego to finally remove him from the throne and instead they poisoned Isolt. This is where Viego's dark side really started to show. 
after trying absolutely everything imaginable, nobody was able to heal his queen. And Viego's angry depression started taking over him. Nel libro dice che uh, Tamavor era piena di ricchezze, ok? Dopo, tutti, dopo tutte le conquiste militari fatte, l'eredità di suo nonno, il leone super figo, e avevano tipo il forziere del tesoro che straboccava di, di qualunque tipo di tesori, artefatti rari, potenti, bla bla bla. Lui, per tentare di trovare una cura per i soldi, ha ingaggiato qualunque tipo di... Eh, curatore, mago, ciarlatano che gli promettesse di salvarla e ha dato vagonate vagonate di ricchezze fino a sfinirle tutte e questo portò il, il regno a, a una, una super rivolta in terra perché giustamente senza, senza soldi, niente cibo senza cibo, ferito After weeks of desperate searching, Viego found out that there may exist a hidden place called the Blessed Isles which held the sacred blessed waters which could heal anything. And so he sent Callista away to find the isles. After a long adventure... Questa qui... Questa qui... Questa capitana della nave che si chiama Vennix è il miglior personaggio di tutto il libro. Per me. Callista succeded and she confirmed that the blessed waters did indeed exist. Sì, è una lontra so the next trip, Callista brought the queen and the king and their soldiers with them. Ah, tra l'altro, tra l'altro, quando Callista è tornata dal suo viaggio dalle Blessed Isle, eh, Isolde era già morta. Da settimane. E Viego, nella sua follia e pazzia, la vedeva ancora viva e praticamente era costantemente ad accarezzare il suo cadavere. Oh. So that they could all heal the queen and be happy ever after. But of course, there was a dark twist. The queen died before they arrived on the isles. And the priests confirmed that they can heal anything as long as the person is alive. But that didn't stop Viego from trying. So after... Sì, perché Trash gli ha detto cazzate. Pezzo di merda. After the priests denied him entrance to the waters, Viego massacred everyone who stood in his way, and following a creepy warden called Thresh, he arrived at the waters and dunked... Il nome Thresh non è il suo vero nome, lui si chiama er... Erlock Grell, Gre... non mi ricordo, non del genere, non me lo ricordo onestamente. Oh. Er... Erlock Grell, vabbè, comunque non si chiamava Thresh. Eh, I Thresher erano... I guardiani delle cri della cripta, chiamati in, italia in italiano li, li chiamava scarti. Tipo spazzatura, no? T trash alla fine è quello vuol dire. E... Trash è stato confinato lì per eh, non dargli nessuna occasione di, di potere. Insomma, era una merda, ragazzi. Era una merda. Era una merda e semplicemente l'hanno buttato lì sotto. Ed è per quello che si chiama Trash. Ed è per quello che lui è incazzato the queen in. For a moment, the waters did resurrect the queen. But then mm. she was turned into a wraith, who killed Viego with his own blade, which caused his soul to be absorbed by the blade. I'm skipping a lot of details here, so just know that yes, the blade can absorb souls. In realtà, <laughs> la, la spada che assorbe le anime. Mmm, Frostmort! We'll actually talk about the blade in the next... Vabbè, in realtà... Quando, quando Isolde ha, stab ha stabbato Viego, lui era ancora dentro la, la fonte dell'acqua benedetta. E siccome le acque curano qualunque cosa finché, si finché sei ancora in vita, si è creato un circolo di... Viego sta morendo, le acque lo riportano, ma lui sta ancora morendo perché c'è la spada dentro. Le acque lo riportano indietro e così via, così via, così via, finché si sono corrotte tutte ed è esploso. Next MMO video, whenever that one comes out. Anyway, after Viego was killed with his own blade, everything exploded in necromantic magic. His queen's soul was shattered into fragments, and the entire place was turned into the Shadow Isles. For a thousand years, Viego's soul stayed there in the blade. Poi è arrivato Thresh. The Pirate King Gangplank ah, vero, was told by Thresh that he could totally pick up the blade. Sì, questo viene, viene fatto vedere nel gioco, in uh, Ruin King. 
His mind was totally strong enough to resist the power of the king. Hey, Spoiler alert, it wasn't. <laughs> and the moment Gangplank picked up the blade, his mind and body was dominated by Viego, who then used that body to fully release himself back into the world. After that, even though everyone's been dead for a thousand years, Viego still wanted to bring his wife back. And so he started to unleash the undead with the black mist all around the world in an attempt to find all the fragments of his queen's soul. Eventually he succeeded and he actually managed to bring the queen's soul back. But immediately after that, he was defeated by the Sentinels of Light. Remember the undead hunting class from the last video? That's them. And not only did they permanently Ma, destroy me. the queen's soul last video, Ma, that's them. Ma, scusa me. Ma perché Akshan sembra che sia truccato? Ma c'ha l'eyeliner. C'ha l'ombretto, ma che cazzo? Vabbè, si vede che ad Akshan piace. Non giudichiamo. And not only did they permanently destroy the queen's soul, because the queen didn't actually want to be resurrected, but Viego's entire story arc ended with him being teleported back to his homeland called Camavor, where he was banished until the present days. Però è vivo, è ancora... See the end of the è ancora vivo. Cioè, sì, c'è ancora lì. E pian piano si sta liberando da... Storyline in the cinematic called Absolution. And this is why Viego is going to be an incredible boss in the MMO. He does have a lot of story behind him. But more importantly, this entire time we have only seen his young, reckless personality, where he acts like a child throwing tantrums. As he's constantly trying to help someone he is obsessively in love with, but the thing is, his entire life he was chasing his queen. He was ready to go beyond death just to be with her. But now he was imprisoned after learning that the queen didn't want to be with him. But also after her soul was permanently destroyed. So once Viego is unleashed from his prison again, instead of a cocky teenager, we are going to have a pissed off king who has nothing to lose. Yeah. And that transformation into the Dark King is something I really want to see. And you can only imagine what the raid is going to look Mica like. Dark di così. Of risen Camavoran soldiers, ancient undead dragons brought from his homeland, the legendary Rasa the Sunderer, Ekarim. and even more legendary Hecarim of the Iron e non penso Kalista, perché Kalista lo odia. Order. But there is also Commander Ledros. Or maybe Carthus, the Death Singer. And finally Thresh, the one who... Ledros? Mm, oddio, non penso che abbia mantenuto il senno. Calista l'ha perso subito. Però boh, chi lo sa che magari l'abbia mantenuto per amor di Calista. Who caused all of this to happen? The hidden master of puppets in the shadows. Esatto. Simply said, Viego has a lot of meaningful enemies serving... Eh, non si sa se è ancora sano. È ancora sano alla fine del libro. Calista è, è, è diventata matta subito. Ma dopo mille anni potrebbe essere diventato pazzo pure lui, chi lo sa? A meno che il suo amore per Calista non sia così forte che ha resistito mille anni, nonostante lei fosse, sia completamente andata. And the raid will be... Comunque, le... Eh... Una cosa storia lo vede ancora sano? Dipende quanto tempo è passato, c'è da vedere. Comunque lui era la guardia del... La guardia del corpo del re, quindi boh, io sa se Viego ha effettivamente un potere di soggiogare gli undead. In teoria dovrebbe averci. Glorious. Si vedrà tra tanti anni. Side note, in the distant future, I kind of want to cover the entire story of Viego. Wish me luck. For the next raid, we are not delving too far away from the undead theme. Because it's time to cover the most brutal badass warrior this universe has Kaiser. ever seen. Super quickly, just for clarity. Viego's deathly magic is really undeath in its true meaning. When he's turning his enemies into undead souls, it's more like he is preventing them from dying. And he's turning them into somewhat living wraiths instead. È Frostmourne. È <laughs> letteralmente Frostmourne. So he's not really the master of death. As you'll see, 
That title that goes to Warning. Warning Kaiser. His story begins as a warlord known as Sun Uzal. During his time, the main continents were occupied by barbaric tribes. Sun Uzal believed that by killing as many people as possible, he would please the gods of the afterlife. And so he forged an empire in blood and death. As his life was near the end, he took great satisfaction in knowing that he would sit at the gods' tables, in the glorious halls of bones. However, when he died, he found no glory waiting for him. Instead, San Uzal stood in an empty grey wasteland, with an occasional soul drifting by. He watched as these lesser spirits faded into the fog, unmade and lost in time. But San Uzal refused to fade. His will, tempered by rage and torment, held him together. In other words, he was simply too angry to die. Come, come he started me. listening to the disembodied whispers around him. Oh dio, Trindamer è un cazzo di bambino con una spada di legno in realtà, al confronto però. And he learned this was Oknun, the language of the dead. Slowly, he came up with a plan. He began whispering temptations into the veil between realms promising power to any who would listen. And sure enough, he managed to tempt a few cultists into bringing him back to life. Lacking any flesh or bone, he told the cultists to bind his spirit to metal plates, forged in the likeliness of his old armor. Ecco perché il master of metal. And so he rose as the revenant of iron and hate. No longer called San Uzal, but rather in Oknun, he was Mordekaiser. Originally, these cultists wanted to use Mordekaiser as a weapon in their trivial wars. But instead, Mordekaiser killed them all, and he <laughs> used their souls to forge himself a brutal mace called Nightfall. With that, Mordekaiser's second conquest of the world started. But this time, he was wielding necromantic magic. All his enemies were confused because it seemed like Mordekaiser only cared about massacre and destruction. Entire generations perished under his campaign. But in reality, there was far more to Mordekaiser's real plan. At the center of his empire, he raised the Immortal Bastion, which became the largest structure on Runeterra. And he used that place to gather information about spirits and death, be it by capturing and studying demons, or torturing yordles until he could harvest their secrets. He did everything in his power to understand the realm. Per quello che il povero il povero Vega era impazzito. Beyond. Eventually, Mordekaiser became such a tyrant the entire continent banded against him. But when he was ultimately defeated, it was not because of his enemies, but rather he was betrayed from his inner circle. The Immortal Bastion had a secret cabal led by a witch we know as Leblanc. They managed to separate Mordekaiser's spirit from his armor and seal the empty armor in a hidden place. As a result, without his physical vessel, Mordekaiser was forced out of the physical realm. What none of the cultists knew, however, is that all of this was according to Mordekaiser's plan. The entire time he was forging a destiny greater than the Halls of Bones. When he finally returned to the empty wasteland of the afterlife, he was met by the hundreds of thousands who died under his reign. Prevented by his dark magic, they would never fade. They would be his eternal army bound to his will. But even the weakest of the spirits were given purpose. Just like he used the souls of the cultists to forge his maze, the weakest of the souls would become the building blocks of his afterworld. And so Mordekaiser became the king of the afterlife. And even though he was cast out, with his physical vessel being banished in the immortal bastion in Noxus, he is already planning on how to return. And once he does so, after so many people were fed into his realm, he would be so powerful, nobody would know how to stop him. Cioè, praticamente è nelle Shadowlands. È il Jailer. Since that is where his story cut off, you know that this is a setup for the future. Hi guys, Bush Even in League of Legends, sometimes more... I sold that, bro. Grazie. 
Grazie di questi gattini fatti dal nulla. Lux, ci hanno pagato la tua operazione. No, più o meno. Grazie. No, non ho visto Whatsapp, sto guardando sto video, aspetta. Soldi riciclati. Rotto. Ho, ho paura di provarci anch'io, non lo farò. Però. Poi me lo spieghi. Lux, ci hanno dato dei soldini per te. Sei felice? Ti dovrò offrire la cena, per forza. Cioè, ti offri tu la cena con i tuoi soldi. Mordekaiser is joked about as a raid boss. Once he starts rolling, you need the entire team to get him down. And Riot would be foolish not to use him as a badass raid boss in the MMO. Especially since we already know some of the other characters that we would see in his raid. When Mordekaiser was conquering the world the second time, he had two demons which he used as his companions. These would be Tybolk, the giant fire demon, and Atakan, an iron-bound shadow To get to him, we would probably have to get past the one who banished him, LeBlanc, and I wouldn't be surprised if we also met Vygar, the Yordle Mordekaiser Tor- Come l'hai chiamato? Come l'hai chiamato? Scusa, Vygar? What the fuck? <laughs> and I wouldn't be surprised if we also met Vygar, the Yordle- Ma quanto cazzo grosso? Mordekaiser tormented to get his yordly secrets. Finally, we would likely fight alongside Swain, one of the leaders of Noxus who is actively trying to root out the dark magics from Noxus. So yeah, maybe Mordekaiser's story is not as long as Viego's, but Mordekaiser is built on brutal conquest. His story is simply badass. And you bet, that's what people want to fight. Ah, ci credo. È praticamente il Lich King 2.0, anzi, pure di più. Arta sembra un cretino in confronto. And this takes us to the last raid I want to show you. Not only is this raid inevitable, but it is going to be the final raid before Riot starts to get sweaty about their future. Because... Uh, il Void? Il Void nel Frelio? Because from that point on they would be forced into making up new enemies. And that's usually no, when the, primo. the lore of MMO scrambles. With the ultimate endgame in Runeterra being the battle against the end of everything. The void. Watchers of the esatto. Void. Now, I know we already quickly summarized the story. No, infatti ha detto che non, non pensa che sarà Aurelion il boss, ma più che altro uno delle sue, una delle sue creazioni. The story of the Watchers when we talked about the world. But we need to quickly do it again, because if they get their own raid, it would be a really cool merging of multiple storylines of this universe. Basically, at the beginning of everything, there was nothing. Just dark, empty void. Until there was a spark of light. This spark of light illuminated the darkness and revealed creepy entities we know as the Watchers. Who, before this event, didn't even know about their own existence. Of course, since this first light woke the Watchers up for the first time, since the beginning of time, the Watchers got annoyed and they decided to silence it so they could sleep again. As they drifted closer, we learned that this spark was indeed our reality. So to get rid of the light, the Watchers tried to poke it and taint it. But they were all... È molto stupido però come lo sta dicendo. È molto stupido come lo stai dicendo. Praticamente questi tizi stavano dormendo, manco loro sapevano che esistevano. Li hanno svegliati e hanno iniziato a punzecchiare la cosa che li, hanno, che li ha svegliati. <ride> Always too big to get through and deal with it themselves. So instead they reached into reality, stole something, corrupted it and released it back. In hopes that it would destroy the rest of the reality. But even that wasn't too successful. Eventually, the Watchers started whispering into the light, and the Ice Witch known as Lissandra answered. Dai, adesso, meme a parte. Non si può dire che questa cosa sia super ispirata agli Eld Gods di, di World of Warcraft.
Vabbè che il Void c'è praticamente in tutto il mondo fantasy, c'è anche in Warhammer 40.000. Però... The Watchers promised her people immortality and great power. In exchange, they asked Lysandra to prepare her world for the coming of the Void. In secret, behind the backs of her two sisters, she agreed. The Watchers empowered the strongest of their followers and turned them into the Iceborn. And soon enough, the Watchers broke into reality in the Freljord. With it, Lysandra's allegiance with the Watchers was undeniable. But as the Watchers rose, for the first time, Lysandra got to see how horrifying they were. And she realized they came here to destroy everything. <laughs> In desperation, Lysandra sacrificed her sisters and the Iceborn to use their magic to freeze the Watchers beneath the ice. But even that magic wasn't enough. Beneath the ice, the Watchers were only sleeping. They would break out should they try to wake up. So these days, Lysandra is kidnapping the surviving Iceborn. She freezes them in her fortress. She is then using their inherent powers to reinforce the ice. And she is feeding their dreams to the Watchers to keep them asleep. As a bonus, Lysandra is killing anyone who remembers the old days. And Praticamente è sia cattiva sia buona. And who could spill out that she actually kinda betrayed all humanity. See, this setup on its own is enough to support a raid. Let's say we raid the Frostguard Citadel, which is where Lysandra is keeping the Watchers frozen. First, we get there by crossing the Howling Abyss. This is the bridge that is incredibly iconic for oh, the Howling Abyss. <laughs> si, va il raid della Ponte dell'Aram! Yeah! This is where you play Aram. <laughs> I bet you never noticed that at the end of the bridge, you can actually see the entrance to the Frostguard Citadel. And in fact, the ghastly shopkeeper is one of the soldiers who remembers the coming of the Watchers. After getting inside, we would fight Lysandra's frozen trolls. These are trolls that Lysandra twisted herself to serve her. But they are also supported by the Harbinger of Trolls. Whatever that is. Then we would fight through that, Lysandra's yeah. army of the Drakworn. These warriors dedicated their lives to Lysandra, knowing that they are protecting the world from the end of everything. Next, we would face the most mysterious creatures of the Freljord. We don't really know what they looked like in their pure form. We only know what they look like after they were corrupted by the Watchers. And these would be the creatures with their very interesting names. There is She Who Wanders, They Who Endure, and It That Stares. Whatever these creatures used to be, now they are titanic, with their eye beam disintegrating reality. Then of course we would have to get past Lysandra ah. herself before we arrive at the Frozen Watcher. I think it's likely that we are going to fight one of these. And what's cool is that even though this is the toughest enemy this universe has to offer, even if we defeat it, we don't really defeat all the Watchers. That's the clever backdoor of this universe. We can't destroy them all. They are the primal force, there is an endless sea of them. If anything, our reality is a parasite in their void. <laughs> so if we defeat a frozen Watcher, all we really do is plug a hole. But the Watchers continue being a threat. Anyway, this Watcher looks strange, doesn't it? It's not really the floating eye that you would imagine. Well, that's because, as it is with all the League of Legends stories, there is a twist. You see, just as the Watchers are able to corrupt a being, They are... Questo dovrebbe essere un campione, è troppo bella. Questo dovrebbe assolutamente essere un campione. Also open to being corrupted themselves. The process always comes from both sides. And so, the more the watchers interact with humans, for example, the more human-like they become themselves. And since the watchers in the Freljord were frozen there for thousands of years, Legends of Runeterra shows us that once they would break through, that's what they would look like. They would have many human-like limbs, the story told us they have fur from all the animals, and they even have a creepy fake face. So no, this is not what a pure Watcher would look like. This is a Watcher tainted by the people of the Freljord. Also, you might be wondering, how do we actually beat the most powerful being in this universe? Well. That's where the stories collide. First of all, Lysandra would be the key to freezing the Watchers. She would have to be on our side at the end there. 
Also, the primal god Orn constructed the bridge leading to the citadel. And this bridge was used as a magical seal to help keep the watchers down, ah, Laram la Orn. down mm. there. So Orn himself would help us. But most importantly, there is another massive storyline that is in Shrima centered around a Voidborn known as Belveth. Because this video is already way too long, just super <laughs> quickly. You know how the Watchers themselves got tainted when interacting with reality? Down in Shrima, a small pocket dimension formed between the Void and our... Oh, guarda qua. È cassa di questo, sì, oddio. Sì, è cassa. Reality. It was sort of like a cancer growth on the Void. In fact, if you dive deeper into this, you may realize that this is directly correlating to real-life cancer. If you don't know, cancer is just living tissue that decided, hey, I don't want to die. And that's exactly what happened here. As the void started consuming people in Shurima, it got tainted by the people and it formed self-awareness. Soon, because this cancerous growth inside the void needed to represent itself, it grew a creature known as Belveth. A voidborn that looks a bit fishy because she consumed a harbor, but also, she doesn't actually like the Watchers, because the Watchers want to end everything. And all Belveth wants to do is to live. Praticamente Belveth è il cancro dei, degli Watchers. Giustamente, lei vuole vivere, poverina. Che cosa ha fatto di male? A parte consumare qualunque cosa che veda. And so these days, Belveth is consuming entire cities at a time. And she is rebuilding everything with the information she got with her ultimate end goal being to rebuild all reality so that she could be reality and she would be strong enough to fight the watchers of course at this time she in un certo in un certo senso anche per vetro non è del tutto malvagia don't really have all the information gathered so whenever she is recrafting city non c'è nessuno di veramente malvagio nel mondo di di lì a parte trash and people it all looks uncanny However, at this point, she consumed hundreds of thousands of people. And she is using all of their brain power, so Belveth is very smart. Now, the reason why this storyline is important is because Belveth once talked to Kaisa, and she offered her a deal. If mortals help Belveth consume reality faster, she would spare them to be the last she would consume. Ah, but... <laughs> Belveth said that she did the calculations and she knows that humanity could never beat her. But at least, with this deal, she gave them the chance to create a weapon or maybe find a hero who maybe could slay her. She knows they could never achieve it, but she is willing to give them the chance. And you see, this is where we can get another twist. This wasn't confirmed, this is purely my theory. But I believe that there is a way to destroy Belveth. See, Belveth believes that we can't beat her. But the fact is, she used hundreds of thousands of human brains to figure it out. But the humans can't even comprehend the power of the Celestials. So I believe Aurelian Soul could destroy her. She just doesn't have the brain power to figure that out herself. So what I think is going to happen is that at some point we are going to beat Belveth. She realizes she was wrong. She realizes that humanity is stronger than her when fighting the Watchers. And she decides to help us destroy them. <clears throat> so should we ever get a raid on the Frostguard Citadel? I wouldn't be surprised if before that we got another raid where we delve into Belveth's little pocket dimension, and with her help, we move to the north. Or, you know, we just destroy her, that would be way cooler. Beh, sì, anche secondo me sarebbe meglio distruggerla e basta. So all of that is still just a wild theory. The fact is, we are fighting the Watchers. That is inevitable. And that was all the raids I wanted to show you. All of them are supported by the lore, and it is up to Riot whether they want Stop to... Stop with Redemption Arc. <laughs> e dai, tutti de hanno, devono averlo così di redimersi, poverini. ...to do them or not. Except the last three raids. Those are happening. There is no way around it. But because people are going to freak out, let me give you some honorable mentions. This universe also technically has the Grim Reaper. While they may have many forms, the most well-known form of death itself Kindle. is 
Kindred. Esatto. We wouldn't really have a good reason. Anche Isolde, Isolde stessa quando era nel, al, al, sull'orlo della morte, quando stava per morire, ha detto che, sta, che, che aveva visto il lupo e l'agnella. To fight them, though. Basta, Luxa! Isn't really an evil entity in this universe, but you know, they exist. I would also love to fight against Vladimir's Hemomancers. Anche io! Anche io vorrei ammazzare sto pezzo di merda. We could also get a raid on the Ursine, with Volibear being the final boss, the primal god of wilderness. In the east, there is also the mysterious demon known as Ashlash. A seven-handed liquid demon that is locked beneath the earth in a place known as the seventh layer. Ah, quella che... quella di... quella di... di Nila. Nila is currently wielding its power and it looks like a setup for the future. Also, there is Fiddlesticks, the primal and most powerful demon on Runeterra. Fiddlesticks itself is just a puppet. The demon is what you can see inside the cage. But because Fiddlesticks is roaming around the world, I couldn't really figure out a raid setting. But you bet we are fighting him at some point! Beh, i boss che si sconfiggono ma non si uccidono saranno per forza i campioni, perché i campioni non possono morire. Eh, la plot armor li protegge, non, non puoi ammazzare i campioni. È impossibile. Sarebbe come tipo toglierli dal gioco, non puoi. If you want creepy video to react to, find Fiddlesticks cinematic. Simply said, the lore supports so much more than what I showed you today. And in the future, I can make a smaller video where I cover the dungeons of this MMO. All being theoretical, of course. But for now, that's it. I'm running out of content, so let's see, um... What do we have next? But, hey, my question, why do you hold the lav mic? <laughs> Wait, what do you... Ok, non ho capito. E <coughs> comunque teorie mica tanto perché questi video qua li stanno guardando anche i dev. Quindi sicuramente ha ah, il suo editor, non lo sapevo. Sicuramente i dev mica sono scemi, soprattutto con scroller, i commenti li legge o almeno quelli più votati. E se qualcuno dice a me piacerebbe questo e questo è tipo votato dalla maggior parte delle persone ed è una cosa fattibile sicuramente la metteranno dentro sono mega scemi, cioè se vedono qualcosa che piace e che sanno che sarà un successo mica non la mettono, no? sono mega cretini